Greetings and welcome, one and all, to Beyond the Walls. Our theme today is love one another. Love is at the heart of our community. Love is the source of our very being, the motivation to which we aspire, the end we hoped to achieve. For as we read in John's first epistle, chapter 4, verse 8 and 16, God is love. One of the ways we understand our heavenly parent, God the Creator, is as the archetype or essence of love itself. Love for love's own sake. We believe that Christ is the example of God's love for the world, and Jesus taught that the greatest commandments were to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. True Christians do not obey these commandments either from fear of hellfire nor from expectation of heavenly rewards. Both are tainted motivations which separate us from God rather than bringing us closer to being at one with God. As we read in the parable of the goats and the lambs, the true disciples were unaware when they had been in God's presence and offered ministry. They did not do so to pass a test or to seek a reward. Instead, they chose to be in the service of their fellow beings out of love for them. Sisters and brothers, it's my belief that when we can make love our purpose, our motivation, and our very being, we are able to participate in that which is eternal. For God is love. In that way, our mission truly becomes Christ's mission and our goal is shared not just among ourselves in the here and now, but among all other disciples who have come before us and all who shall live hereafter. Therefore, let us come together and set this time apart for the sacred, recognizing the Spirit's connecting presence in our midst as we ponder and appreciate that love which is divine. And as we begin our worship service, we go to Stratford, Ontario, where Lois Neeb is here to read our call to worship. Our call to worship this morning is taken from the 161st section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 3a. Open your hearts and feel the yearnings of your brothers and sisters who are lonely, despised, fearful, neglected, unloved. Reach out in understanding, clasp their hands, and invite all to share in the blessings of community created in the name of the one who suffered on behalf of all. Let us build a house where thank the Beyond the Walls Choir. This entire service is a hymn festival and we will be hearing hymns that celebrate love all uh, service long as we'll also be receiving ministry on that same subject. And with that in mind, we go to Independence, Missouri, where Kathy Robinson offered a prayer, bring us together in unity and love. Dear Lord, as we gather all around the world, we are so grateful for your love and presence in our lives. This has been a difficult year for all of us, and we have sometimes forgotten that you are there. But we are reassured when we pause and focus like this that you do love us and are always with us. 
in this time together this morning, we pray that we will feel your love and that we will be very aware of your Holy Spirit drawing us together in love and unity. Help us to be open to the words we will hear that remind us of our call to be your presence in the world. And help us to be lifted up by your spirit and ready to go out to share your love with others, saying, here am I, Lord. These things we pray in the name of your son. Amen. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray that our unity may one day be restored, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes, they'll know. go to Portsmouth, Ohio, where Justin DeLong, who just this weekend led a temple trip to Kirtland and, and had a whole baptismal service, spoke to us about being called to teach about God's love. Community of Christ Doctrine and Covenant section 164 verse 5 states, it is imperative to understand that when you are truly baptized into Christ, you become part of a new creation. By taking on the life and mind of Christ, you increasingly view yourselves and others from a changed perspective. Former ways of de defining people by economic status, social class, sex, gender, or ethnicity no longer are primary. Through the gospel of Christ, a new community of tolerance, reconciliation, unity and diversity and love is being born as a visible sign of the coming reign of God. It is my prayer that we each seek to build a community of tolerance, reconciliation, and unity in our diversity as we seek to bring God's love to all of God's children. We must abandon our thoughts and actions that separate and divide us and focus on things that unite us together in our love for one another. We must learn to look one another in the eye and clasp the hand of our neighbor as we struggle through life together when we experience injustice. We must respond to God's call as Samuel did and say, here I am. Here I am. And I wanna close with this quote from Nadia Bowles Waver. My spirituality is most active, not in meditation, but in the moments when I realize God may have forgot, may, God may have gotten something beautiful done through me, despite the fact that I am a failure. And when I am confronted by the mercy of the gospel so much that I cannot hate my enemies, and when I am unable to judge the sin of someone else because my own issues are too much in the way, and when I have to bear witness to another human being suffering, despite my desire to be left alone, 
when I am forgiven by someone, even though I do not deserve it. And my forgiver does this because he too is trapped by the gospel. When traumatic things happen in the world and I have no place, and I have nowhere to place them or make sense of them. But what I do have is a group of people who gather with me every week. People who will mourn and pray with me over the devastation of something like school shootings. And when I end up changed by loving someone, I thought I'd, I'd never choose out of a catalog, but whom God sends my way to teach me about God's love. Responding to God's voice will transform your life. It will take you to places and people you would not expect. And your life will be blessed by those experiences. When we place ourselves in the lives and struggles of others, we catch a glimpse of God's peaceable kingdom, a kingdom where we each bear the burdens of others and we work to make the world better for each of God's children. Let us keep our eyes upon the horizon which God's voice is calling us. And may we never stop listening to that voice. Thank you. de tout ton cœur, de toute ton âme et de tout ton esprit. C'est le plus grand et le premier commandement. Et le second est, aime ton prochain comme toi-même. So complicated, right? For, for those of us who are not theologians, so much scripture, so many rules, so many commandments. And so, you want it simple? God, love. <laughs> love God, rather. And <laughs> love your neighbor. We're considering a lot of passages about love that we have in our scriptures. So what does this passage from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, suggests to you? How does it make you feel when you hear this? Command, being commanded to love God and your neighbor. Is this love an imposition or is it a gift? Si amas, te sentís presionado a cumplir con cosas que parecen innecesarias para amar. O sea, ¿qué pasaría si todos proclamáramos este amor en voz alta y nada más? I invite you to share today what's on your mind, what's on your heart, and sometimes what's, what's on your gut, always in a respectful manner in the chat box on YouTube and Facebook. When we hear, love one another, can we do it? Can you do it? As always, Thank you for coming together as a congregation beyond the walls and thank you for clicking like and for sharing this video as always. And thank you for your comments. Your comments are such a blessing because your comments build this community every Sunday. I wanna say thank you to those of you who have said hi on, on Facebook first. So hello, Frank, thank you. Hello, Bill, hello, Raymond, hello, oops, let me scroll.
Hello, Isabel. Hello, Barbara. Hello. Uh, well, my, my phone is not, my Facebook is not being very responsive, but we'll get there, folks. In the meantime, let's see who's on YouTube. Thank you so much, Dean, for supporting uh, this ministry. Thank you to our apostle, Art Smith, who's with us today. Welcome, Jamie. I love that hymn, too. Welcome, Charles. Uh, thank you. Who else is? Thank you, Neil. Thanks, everyone, for adding. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, everyone, for saying hi, for sh sharing this uh, this video, inviting someone to Christ today. Every time you click like, every time you share. So for for this ministry, there we go. Brian on, on Lee and on Facebook. Now my Facebook is working. For this ministry that you do every Sunday, I want to thank you. Por ese ministerio que haces todos los domingos, te doy las gracias. Por ese ministerio de tous les dimanches, je vous remercie. Thank you, Leandro. Thanks, everyone. And now uh, for another prayer, uh, one of expressing God's loving ways in our lives. We go to Independence, Missouri with Richard Trout. Our God, we come to you at this time as a people separated by hundreds, even thousands of miles physically. Yet we are unified in seeking your presence in our lives and in our gathering together now as one body. We recognize the disunity, the trust, and anger of many people in this world, and we confess our own impatience and sometimes our participation in the disunity at times. We ask for your guidance and empowerment in being voices of love, reason, compassion, and peace wherever we are and can have influence. We ask that in our gathering today, we might gain more patience and understanding of how to express these values in our lives as we worship you in unity and devotion to expressing your loving ways in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Blessed be the time that binds our hearts in Christian love. The Continue in Independence, Missouri, where Danny Belrose taught a lesson that Christ is love incarnate. Most recently, 
Christ's mission is our mission, serve to articulate our purpose. I believe them. I've written hymns supporting them. I've taught classes promoting them. But nevertheless, statements are by their nature external. They remain external until they are internalized and become one with us. We cannot be a part of Christ's mission until it becomes part of us. Head, heart, hands and feet. Now, no question, Jesus proclaimed his purpose in Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them who are bruised. Nevertheless, my Jesus didn't think of himself as being on mission. My Jesus, you say? You mean there are more than one Jesus? You have a Jesus? Yes. There's Matthew's Jesus, Mark's Jesus, Luke, John, and Paul's Jesus, and they are uniquely different. They are not the same. There's your Jesus and my Jesus, who amazingly thinks exactly like me. My Jesus didn't make lists and check them twice. He didn't strategize his ministry months in advance or next month's good news objectives. Well, let's see, I've preached the, the attitudes on the plane, on the hillside. Um, how would it go over the seaside? I really need to polish up that good Samaritan story. Gotta put a needle in those uptight Pharisees again. Peter, James, you have to tighten up on crowd control. No more hilltops, you know I get vertigo. Don't shoot the messenger. I know that was a bit over the top. I'm not saying that Jesus was unintentional. Nor am I saying that he didn't have goals, hopes, dreams, and aspirations. I'm saying he lived from the inside rather than the outside. His external ministry was internally fueled. His ministry was intuitive, natural, often impromptu. I have to say that the spark of divinity that sets my Jesus apart was he didn't need reminding because reminding was constantly in him. Life with all its ambiguities and messiness was in him as well as right in front of him. He acted from the inside out. And what was on the inside? Love. Love incarnate. A persistent passion for creation's highest good and rejection of all that was not. Shalom, shalom, the goal of the highest good. Christ's mission becomes our mission only when fueled by love. So bear with me. What matters most for me is not so much Christ's mission. What matters most is love that fuels that mission so that a part of us, it never needs rebinding. A love within us that is unconditional, uncaused, unmerited, unrelenting. Love that is always seeking, but never requiring. You see, love was not something Jesus did. Love was who he was and who he is. Jesus saw needs and filled them. What mattered most to Jesus was not embracing mission, but being mission. What mattered most was men and women and boys and girls fully alive. And as recipients of such love, we are transformed inside and able to love others likewise.
happy that we're going to Tahiti in French Polynesia, where Amanda Boussi offers a prayer on the topic, we are all loved equally and unconditionally. Dieu, Père éternel, centre de toutes choses et source de vie, nous t'adressons nos salutations, Seigneur, en ce magnifique jour. Merci pour ton amour et pour ta confiance en nous. En cet instant, nous sommes réunis pour te rencontrer dans cette adoration que nous avons préparée, qu'elle soit comme une tresse que nous tissons ensemble avec toi. Nous t'offrons nos talents pour le bien-être et pour la vie éternelle de nos âmes. Nous prions afin que tu nous aides à regarder plus profondément en nous et à discerner la beauté de notre extérieur, mais également de notre intérieur. Aide-nous à voir nos points communs. Aide-nous à comprendre que nous sommes tous des enfants et que nous sommes tous aimés de manière égale et inconditionnelle. Que ton souffle de vie nous inonde et que ta grâce soit sur nous tout au long de notre service. Amen. Yeah. 
Thanks again to the choir for this amazing music ministry this week. And now we go to Melbourne, Florida, where our friend Charlie Brown taught a lesson on love for every individual on earth. We, the people of planet earth, have a problem. It's a people problem. And this is the scope of our problem. There are 70.8 million refugees in our world. That is 1% of the entire population. There are 272 million migrants in our world. That is 3.5% of the world population. When we combine these numbers, nearly one in every 20 people in the world is or has been displaced from their home. One in 20. But these are just numbers. Big numbers. Nothing to do with me or mine. Except. Except every single tick in the number is a living breathing human being, a human being with a life story, an identity, a name. Our problem is not going to go away. In fact, our problem is getting bigger every year. And how have the refugees and immigrants been treated in most countries around the world? including the U.S. and Canada? One word sums it up pretty well. Poorly. The dominant cultures, wherever they are and whenever they hold sway, have a very poor record in dealing with those other people. Yet scripture clearly says that we should do the opposite. The instruction is to respect the alien and care for him as you would yourself. And it goes all the way back to Exodus, Exodus 23 and 9. You should not oppress a resident alien. You know the heart of the alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Leviticus 19:33. When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. And it goes on. Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Malachi, on and on, all reiterating the same theme. This instruction is reinforced in Community of Christ Theology and Practice, the Doctrine and Covenants, Modern Revelation, is very clear on what our attitude should be toward the children of God, all of the children of God. Section 162, 6a and b. From the earliest days, you have been given a sacred principle that could, declares the inestimable worth of all persons. Do not forget. The one who created all humankind grieves at the shameful divisions in the human family. A prophetic people must work tirelessly to tear down walls of separation and build bridges of understanding. Section 163, 3CA and 4A. That which seeks to harden one human heart against another by constructing walls of fear and prejudice is not of God. Be especially alert to these influences, lest they divide you or divert you from the mission to which you are called. Open your ears to hear the pleading of mothers and fathers in all nations who desperately seek a future of hope for their children. Do not turn away from them, for in their welfare resides your welfare. We have a problem, 
a people problem. We must seek life-affirming solutions to our problem. Else, the problem will surely overwhelm us. Will you join me in the prayer for peace? Lord, source of our being, we stand waiting for your peace to enter our broken and chaotic relationships. Just as you wait for us to pause long enough to invite you in, may your reconciling presence bring us to a point of apology and forgiveness, of offering and receiving, and unity. Lord of all earth's peoples, the world stands waiting for your peace to calm the warring nations, to stem the tide of violence we inflict against one another. Just as you wait for us to stop the madness long enough to see one another as family. We remember all nations and all people as we pray today. May your profound compassion for your children flow within us. Enable us to surrender our hatred and fear and be filled instead with your loving kindness and mercy. Creator of all, your creation stands waiting for your healing touch to restore all living things to oneness and wholeness. Just as you wait for us to revere what you have given us as a sacred gift. May your generous offering of water, earth, air, and all that has life remind us of our physical and spiritual connection with everything that was, that is, and that will be. Help us honor our call as stewards of this earth. We ask for this blessing of your peace in and through Jesus Christ. Amen. Cuando Judas había salido, dijo Jesús, Ahora es glorificado el Hijo del Hombre y Dios es glorificado en él. Si Dios es glorificado en él, también Dios lo glorificará en sí mismo y pronto lo glorificará. Hijitos, todavía sigo un poco con ustedes. Me buscarán, pero, como le dije a los judíos, a donde yo voy, ustedes no pueden ir. Así les digo a ustedes ahora, un mandamiento nuevo les doy. Que se amen los unos a los otros. Como los he amado, ámense también ustedes los unos a los otros. En esto conocerán todos que son mis discípulos si tienen amor los unos por los otros. I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad that springtime is finally here, at least in the Northern Hemisphere. 
This last winter was particularly cold and snowy in Toronto. It snowed so much that the city had to pile up the snow on the bike lanes. If you can imagine, we, the cyclists, had to share the road with cars and buses and streetcars as the streets became very narrow. As you can see, that's a bike lane that you can see on screen there. It's a pile of snow. So streets narrow, slippery. And some days I had to walk uh, all the way down here because the bikes were trapped in ice at the bike sharing stations and I just couldn't manage to pull one out. And some, some days I had to just walk because there was just too much snow like that. I didn't want to take the streetcar uh, because you know, since COVID everyone would wear masks but then they would take them off to sip their Tim Hortons coffee on the, on the streetcars. So walking cautiously through ice and snow made my commute to Toronto Center Place a lot longer than usual. Sometimes the sun was shining very warmly over an immaculately white snow. Sometimes the snow was falling, the wind was blowing, the sun had gone down. And I walked through parks in my way down here where homeless folks had been camping year round over the last two years. And I walk in front of this Salvation Army shelter that we have on screen where people would hang out uh, on, in front of it no matter the weather conditions. I wonder how long they had been already out there in the sidewalks or you know, sometimes in the middle of the street uh, on, the, on the road and how much longer they were going to be outside in those terrible weather conditions. And I also wondered what had happened to them. It's not just one, two, it's so many. What their professions had once been and their passions and their hobbies. I wanted to get a, imagine them before, how they used to be. <sighs> like the, their childhood dreams or their favorite song. And whatever happened to them, could that same thing also happen to me, I wonder. Would people judge me if they saw me wearing dirty clothes, carrying all my belongings in a big garbage bag? Would they say that it is my fault or that I deserve it because they saw me walking um, out of the safe injection clinic right here, the block away, or desperately trying to like just sweeping the ground with my hands trying to find a bit of crack that fell off my pocket, what would they say? And would anyone really love me if I were in that situation? So one day after seeing all that suffering, I started working on, on Jesus Walk the Lonesome Valley. Beautiful, beautiful hymn uh, that we've done with our choir. It says, we have to walk this lonesome valley by ourselves, and we have to stand our trial by ourselves. And so this emphasis on the individual inner journey, on the self, made me really, really uncomfortable because with so much suffering and injustice in the world and here I am working on this hymn that wants me to worry about me. You know, I thought I had already walked a long way by myself and that I had stewed my trial by myself many times. God, I think I already learned this lesson. And yet, this last winter, the Spirit once again was leading me to walk the Lonesome Valley. 
I left the Catholic Church when I was a teenager, and I believe that's when I started to walk the lonesome valley that this hymn talks about. When I was in my 20s, I became a member of a Buddhist community that practiced what is called the path of the Bodhisattva. A Bodhisattva uh, is one who focuses on helping others in their path to enlightenment at the expense of their own spiritual advancement. Yet, it is precisely by practicing selflessness in this way that the Bodhisattva ultimately attains enlightenment. So that sounds wonderful in theory, but every time I was helping somebody, I could not stop thinking, am I doing this for them? Am I loving them? Or am I doing it just for myself? This is just self-interest, ultimately. Would I be doing this if I knew I wouldn't be getting anything out of it? Would I be doing this if I knew that no matter how much good karma I collected, bad things could still happen to me? In John 13, 34 to 35, Jesus says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this Everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So, can we do this? Can we really love one another, especially unconditionally? Not just the ones that are easy to love, but everyone, as Jesus is commanding us to do. And so, do I really love the homeless folks that I see on my way to church, more do I just pity them and the, the ones that are trapped by addiction, the mentally ill, and also the aggressive ones, the, the scary ones. Um, do I love the driver who parks in the bike lane? All the city you know, employee who piles up uh, all the snow on the bike lane. Do I love the driver who drives too slowly when I'm in a hurry? Do I love the guy who just calls me words I can't say at church just because what I'm wearing or because of my hair? Do I love the woman who tells me to go back to my country because of the color of my skin? Do I love the people who feel the urge to send us quite hurtful messages on social media every day? Do I love the guys who pushed me off the bike and broke my arm and beat me and stole all my belongings and laughed at me as I got away? And do I love the men who were my superiors at work who sexually harassed me when I was young and in need of money? And it's not just about me. That was a lot about me. But do I love the psychopath who killed an innocent young man a block away from my apartment a few weeks ago, just exiting the, the subway station? Do I love the, the world leaders who bring death and misery upon their neighbors? And I could go on and on. I have to confess that the answer is no, I, I, I don't love them. Well, no, not yet, at least. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Uh, God, this is, this is hard because this commandment sounds so simple. It's, it is so easy to say that we love everyone, that we have to love everyone, yet this commandment is hard to follow. Can we love everyone? People out there are not always nice to us or to others. Uh, 
And sometimes that can be deliberately mean. And so it's, it is through, through all these experiences that we've all had in our lives that we gain resiliency. And resiliency can be good, but sometimes we learn to cope by building defensive walls around us. And these walls can feel a lot like resiliency, but are in fact obstacles. Obstacles that we ourselves put in our spiritual path. And why is that? Cette rampart. Elle pourrait te protéger, mais, mais aussi elle rend difficile de donner et de recevoir. De recevoir de l'amour. Pas seulement donner, mais aussi recevoir. The, these walls that we build around ourselves may protect us, but they also make it really difficult for us to give and also to receive love. Esas murallas que hemos construido alrededor nuestro nos pueden proteger, pero también hacen muy difícil que podamos dar y también recibir amor. My experiences had led me to feel very safe inside the formidable walls that I had built around myself. But one day, our friend John Hamer, who's now in the controls for the first time, I think, in a long time, invited me to offer a ministry of music at the Toronto Congregation of Community of Christ when we were meeting at the uh, Bathurst Street building that you can see on screen. I knew very little about this church, uh, but I accepted the invitation. And there I was that Sunday morning in this big, beautiful chapel, although sadly there were about 15 people there, all of them quite older than I was. Uh, but after the service, they all welcomed me like the prodigal son. Everyone was so happy to see me. So much love. and these walls of Jericho came tumbling down. And they told me they had recently sold the building and uh, that they didn't know what was going to happen. And I felt called to help. That's when I started attending every Sunday, actually. Like many people at the time, I had this idea that churches and other religious institutions were static things, stubbornly standing on their dogma, their traditions. Yet this faith community was shaking that prejudice for me. The more I learned about Community of Christ, the more I realized that this church was walking a spiritual path like I was. This faith community was looking into the reality of impermanence and change that had attracted me to Buddhism. As more and more walls came tumbling down, I realized that this call that I was responding to was precisely the way of the Bodhisattva that I mentioned. But this time I was certain I was not doing it for my own individual benefit. So Leandro, why were you doing it? And why did you join Community of Christ? I hear that question all the time. I felt like, I feel like I've been walking a lonesome valley all my life that the Spirit leads me to walk this path once and again. Most of my life, I felt a bit lost in this valley, a bit lonely, but one day somewhere in this valley, I found a faith community. And we started to walk together. And at first, I thought that we were walking the same path just because we had come to a narrow pass. No other way to go. But the valley has widened and it's full of paths now. Uh, but this community and myself, with our own feet, together we're blazing a new trail. And I'm still walking a lonesome valley. 
the valley of spiritual exploration, but at the same time, I'm not alone and I can find inspiration, support, leadership, and likewise, support others. And yet, we're, we're not focused on the pot of gold at the end of the valley. We're focused on the here and now, the step we're taking right now. So if we're not doing this because we're expecting a reward, then why are we doing it? What do you think? Why are we doing this? So again, this question, why did you join Community of Christ? And that's because I think our motivation is genuine love. I think that even though it's not easy to love one another, I have discovered that love for love's own sake is not only possible, but is in fact the door to our spiritual awakening, the true path to enlightenment that I have been looking for all my life. So simple, yet so hard, like a Zen koan, it doesn't tell you anything you didn't already know intellectually, but it opens your heart so that you feel the call to love each other, not just up here as a commandment, but you feel it with your heart and with your soul and with your mind and your whole body. Love one another. Can we do it? I don't think we already do, at least not all the time, but I do think we can. What do you think? forth with Paul's instruction to the Colossians in the third chapter of his letter, verses 12 through 14. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. 
Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Amen.